Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're delighted to have all of you here this evening. My name is Penny Wright. I'm in charge of adult programs here at the library. And many of you are familiar faces, and some of you are new to us, so thank you for coming. We were very happy to um, learn of the willingness of our local pastor, your, many of your local pastor at Sacred Hearts Church, in coming to speak tonight about medical ethics. <clears throat> and I know he's known, Father Mike Vitrano is known to many of you, but for those of you who may not know about him, I'll tell you a couple of things. Dr. Michael Vitrano, an ordained Catholic priest, in addition to being the much-loved and respected pastor of Sacred Hearts Church here in Southampton Village, is Research Assistant Professor, Department of Preventive Medicine, SUNY School of Medicine at Stony Brook, where he directs the second year program in medical ethics and humanities. Dr. Vetrano received his PhD in Systematic Theology, Moral Theology, and Medical Ethics from Fordham University. In addition to his responsibilities coordinating the professional development of medical students at the university, Dr. Vetrano's interests include studying the relationship between ethics, religious values, and suffering in the experience of patients teaching medical students about appropriate interest in the spiritual life of their patient and the interface between the physician's own spirituality and the practice of medicine, and the development of models for professional communication, especially the development of skills that enable students and residents to achieve greater understanding, compassion, and satisfaction from their relationships with patients. It's a great honor to have Reverend Michael Petrano here. Please welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was uh, quite an introduction there. Uh, my, my family would recognize me. I'm shocked to hear what you say. Let's <laughs> uh, get this map going. Good. Um, so it's great to be here with you tonight and be able to uh, not be preaching at <laughs> once and to, to talk about some of the, uh, the other things that have uh, occupied a, a good bit of my, my life and interests. Uh, I, I uh, consider it a, a privilege to be uh, uh, part of the church here in Southampton and also part of the uh, medical education up at Stony Brook. And I've been there for about 15 years now. And, uh, and during that time, probably gone, undergone a, a good bit of evolution in my own sense of uh, doctors and how they work and, and, and especially how how we uh, interact with them. Um, ethics, of course, is, is pretty popular. Uh, you, you find a lot of different places. Uh, I, I knew we had made it <laughs> when I saw this book in the store. You know, medical ethics, for dumb, when they have a dummies book about your profession, you're, you're really on the top of it somewhere. And, and, I, and I bought this as a, I, I bought the book as kind of a joke to show my students and then started reading it, but, so it's now assigned. So it's actually, you know, most of the dummies books are actually pretty good, and, and this is actually a, a pretty good summary. So if you see that, you're interested. It's, it's not a bad book, uh, not something bad to have at all. Um, these days, when you give talks, you always start with some disclosures, and uh, Penny's covered a lot of these. So I, I am the Director of Ethics and Humanities at Stony Brook, pastor of Sacred Heart Church, and I also thought I'd mention that, that I'm not a physician. And, and, that, and that's sort of important because one of the things that's happened over all these years of being part of the medical world of Stony Brook is I've, I've, I've come to uh, appreciate uh, with great humility uh, what, what the life of, uh, of doctors are from the inside. Um, it, it takes a while uh, working with them as colleagues before uh, uh, I, I kind of was invited in to hear a little bit more about the joys and struggles of being a physician, about its particular complexities and about, uh, you know, some of the uh, things they endure in part of, uh, of being in that profession. And uh, one of the things I've learned, which is really important, is that uh, medicine is more complicated than most people would ever really be able to understand, unless you actually went into it and devoted yourself to it and 
earned the degree and went to the residency. It's um, a lot of times when uh, we say to doctors things like, just put this in simple terms. It, it really is not a very simple thing. Because it's one thing, it's, uh, it's the human body, which is enormously complicated, but it's also something else. It's the human body in, in interaction with uh, someone wanting and intending to be uh, a healer. And, and, and that interaction is, you know, enormously complicated mix between the scientific and the human. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you be a good practitioner and a, a faithful person to the science of medicine and also be uh, very involved with the human, you know, the human dynamics of your patients? And uh, if you know any uh, really great physicians, uh, you know that they're the people that manage to, to, to really uh, bring those two things together. So um, tonight, what I, what I really want to talk to you about is uh, ethics and how it connects to, uh, to us as patients. Um, and, and in a sense, you might want to think of it this way. Uh, I've spent a lot of my time trying to teach doctors about ethics. But really, when it comes to the ethics of the doctor-patient relationship, which is in a lot of ways the important thing, it's, uh, it, it really can learn some things as patients that can make our interaction more beneficial and more satisfying with physicians. As with any uh, communicative type thing, it's a two-way street. But I thought, you know, let me just give you a little bit of an overview of ethics just uh, to kind of understand where I, where I see it being these days. Um, probably if you uh, study ethics, especially medical ethics, you, you always go back to the, uh, the Hippocratic Oath, not the Hippocritical Oath, the Hippocratic Oath, that's, that's something else. And, uh, you know, Hippocrates lived an awful long time ago, and, and he sort of found this uh, sense of professionalism on the part of uh, physicians. Uh, a lot of it had to do with physicians being faithful to their profession and its dignity, and faithful to other physicians, and kind of only a few sort of really big moral rules, like, you know, don't kill your patients, don't be intimate with them, don't... Uh, don't spill their secrets, things like that. Um, and to bow, of course, always to do your best. But it, but it was the tradition that was dominant for a long time, was the tradition of, of sort of trying to maintain and, and protect the profession. Um, to think a little bit about how ethics is developed, you have to think a little bit about how, how medicine is developed. And, you know, we, we, uh, we have such amazing medical care now and such amazing medical technology. But, but in a lot of ways, um, it's only a couple of hundred years old. You know, you go back to, uh, to the first sort of uh, uh, surgery and under anesthetic that was only uh, 1846. We're not even up to the 200th anniversary of that. Um, you know, Joseph Lister, understanding uh, the role of antiseptic surgery, that's uh, even newer. And uh, penicillin, which was probably the, the first real effective treatment for infections, uh, not even 100 years old. And, and this is sort of important because medicine in the, in the recent two centuries uh, becomes something very concrete, where, where physicians can really do things in a very, uh, very pointed way to, to heal heal diseases and uh, improve people's uh, problems and so forth. And, and, and so you might say that medicine as being like pointedly effective is a, is a fairly, a fairly in the whole history of the world, a uh, fairly new thing. And you know, we, we now, would, I would say that most people feel that, well, it's probably either already or at some point going to be cures for everything. That's our optimism, right? and we kind of feel the way that the, the science is going that way. Um, at the same time, there's some changes in how uh, doctors practice that affects the nature of their relationship to people. Um, René Lenech, um, somewhere around the turn of the two or three centuries ago, it invented the stethoscope. And before that, you know, before that, how did, how did doctors listen to patients' uh, lungs and heartbeats? Well, uh, a lot of them use a very intimate method. They would just put their head on your chest, or they might um, they might use a little listening cup or 
something like that. But um, you know, uh, there there's a certain in this advent of diagnostic skills. There's a certain almost um, distancing or loss of intimacy to the patient. Uh, the natural need for it kind of gradually receded in medicine, and uh, and and generally now. Uh, Diagnostic tests, diagnostic imaging, is really sort of the important thing. So, if you if you go to a, a physician with a particular complaint, you, you can almost bet that it's going to lead to a little cascade of some kind of testing and imaging, and that's going to be the basis of trying to you know ferret out and figure out exactly what's uh, what's wrong with you. That's also probably one one of the things that maybe deters people from. Uh, going to doctors is because you know any any particular visit is likely to produce a cascade of other visits uh, somewhere down the road. But there's a certain kind of um, almost a stepping back, if you will, and and yet we we know that a good part of what healing is about it is in this relationship, in its intimacy, its compassion, uh, its sense of presence, its sense of trust. It's not only things that are done, but relationship that is the, the healing thing. Things that are done are hugely important, uh, but at the same time there's a, a bigger picture of the relationship that is actually equally important. Um, ethics and the way that it develops, uh, uh, does anybody know who uh, well, his name is up there? Uh, Belding Scribner, uh, around 1950, anybody know what he, uh, well, he developed something very important, and he, uh, Students of no uh, renal dialysis. So Scribner uh, Scribner developed the uh, AV shunt that made it possible for people to uh, have their blood move from their body to a dialysis machine and back fairly efficiently, and also figured out how to use a relatively new synthetic material in those dialysis machines so they did not have to be taken apart and boiled and cleaned and everything else, and that was, of course, Teflon. Um, the interesting thing about, about uh, what he did, though, is that he invented a very, very powerful and effective technology, but, not, but, but there was not enough of it to go around. And it was hugely expensive. And so here in the 1950s, uh, Scribner, working out at the Swedish hospital out in uh, Seattle, in Washington, out there, um, they, they had to try to figure out, of the many, many applicants for renal dialysis, who, who would they actually treat? And I don't know if, a number, if any of you, in a, there was maybe about 10 or so years ago in New York on Broadway, uh, uh, an off-Broadway play actually called uh, The God Committee, and it was essentially a takeoff on something that happened out in Seattle, which was that they tried to figure out, well, well how are we going to decide if we've got only 10 spaces at our machines, of the 50 applicants, who are we going to take? So they were actually making decisions about who to admit to these uh, these protocols. And uh, you know, they had a they had a committee. It's uh, uh, it's a little bit of a, a sort of a, a tell on the uh, the culture at that time because they had the minister, the doctor, the lawyer, the banker, the political figure, and the housewife. And they figured that that covered everybody. Society was represented in, in those people. Um, at the at the same time, there's also this kind of amazing sense that this was really uh, inadequate, and uh, all of the uh, any kind of trying to make decisions about who who should get care and who shouldn't uh, was very very disturbing. Um, it was solved in a very American way because renal dialysis became something eligible for federal benefits and so you know the, the can't pay for it thing at least temporarily went away and, and now you know uh, build the machines and bring in the patients and, and, it, and it was paid for in these days uh, at least in the United States there's really no limits on, on renal dialysis um, but it was interesting because that, that kind of made people think, well, ethics is, how do we make those kinds of decisions? How do we, you know, sit on the seat of God and decide who we treat, who we don't treat? Uh, other things began to happen. The other thing, too, is that in a lot of ways there was a, a sense that 
um, medicine in some ways had, had become sometimes too good. Um, there were people on respirators and people on, uh, you know, being kept alive with sophisticated drugs and resuscitation <clears throat> techniques. And, and you sometimes began to hear from people things like, well, well, what about death with dignity? What about if you don't want all that? What if, what if you, you know, what, 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 what if you don't want that for your family member? Is there any way now out sometimes of, of, this, uh, of this whole um, amazing ability to treat? Uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote a book uh, on death and dying and, and suggested probably for one of the first times that, that we would uh, all, both patients, families, doctors, have conversations about things like terminal illness. I mean, I, I, mean, I can remember a time even as a priest where, well, if somebody was dying, you didn't tell people they were dying. And, that, and it, it was in a way almost like not really a point to that discussion. You know, it was felt that, well, what was going to happen was going to happen anyway, but there's, not, there's no decisions to be made. Uh, life is kind of going to take its own trajectory. And, and so why bring that sort of uh, fatalism or anxiety into the conversation? So we, we just didn't sort of talk about that. Uh, even though we, we often knew that, um, that patients they wanted to talk about those things, and maybe there were some uh, decisions and things to be made, even if not medical decisions. Uh, I always uh, re remember a story. This is actually uh, Fred, Fred Kelbel's aunt, uh, Alan, who, uh, was, uh, whose mom was, uh, was, was dying, and uh, I would go to visit her most weeks, and, and the family would say, uh, you know, before you go in to see Aunt Helen, remember, she doesn't know that she's dying, so don't start talking to her about that because it's going to upset her. And, and I would promise I absolutely will not say anything. I'll just go in and, and pray with her. And I would go in and sit down, and Aunt Helen would say, well, you know, I'm, I'm dying, and uh, I'm not going to be here long, and uh, people are sort of, you know, very concerned about this, and I don't know how to talk to them about it. Um, and, and so with, with all this medical ability, now we're trying to have these conversations with each other that we never, we never really had to have before. And then some huge decisions. Uh, anybody know who that is? Oh, yeah, that's, who, that's her name. Yeah, very good. Karen, Karen Ann Quinlan, right? And, and uh, Karen Ann Quinlan, of course, a young woman, and she had uh, overdosed on, uh, uh, on some things at a party, ended up in a persistent vegetative state ended up on a respirator and her family said she would not want to be maintained like that on a respirator. She would not want to live that way and we're Catholic and Catholics have a rule about extraordinary means that it's not morally required. So we want you to take her off the respirator. Well, this was huge. I mean, there was hardly any way to think our way through this. And so um, what do Americans do when they're facing something like that? Um, we got lawyers involved. And, and, and we started to figure out um, how morally certain would you have to be about a patient's wishes for, for us to follow that? Did, did we have any real proof that Karen herself would decide things that way? And of course, when you think about it, like, that, well, that's complicated. I mean, how many of us at 21 years old have expressed to anybody mature, insightful desires about, you know, how, what we want to have happen to us in the case of a, a real tragedy. Um, and if you kind of know, eventually what happened is that the, uh, uh, her, her petition was eventually won in court. Um, she was disconnected from the respirator and breathed for a while, I think almost 10 years before uh, she actually passed away. But what really happened as a result of all those things is that the world of ethics then became uh, focused on the very important principle of, of autonomy. You know, how, how do we allow people and doctors together to make decisions? And, and, and this is very influential in, uh, in, in, where the, uh, in where the trajectory of ethics is going. Um, in, in Stony Brook, where I teach, we, we are trying to tell our young students that the real important thing of ethics is not the technical things of all these quandaries. That the real, the real whole point of ethics 
is not the unusual thing, the conjoined twins, the um, a, a patient in a very rare and unusual situation, and how to decide it. But the real thrust of ethics is in the doctor-patient relationship, and particularly in this, in how we might uh, learn to be empathetic and compassionate to patients. And, and not only in, in that institution, my institution, but in a good number of others, uh, this is becoming, um, and let me show you this video. This is kind of an important sort of uh, um, portrayal of what ethics is about.
So now in the, uh, the, the modern day of medical education, I wanted you to see that because that, that's what we try to teach. Is it, is it new? Well, actually, it's, it's not really new. Um, here, uh, William Peabody, early part of the 1900s, uh, uh, in a very famous address uh, up in New England, said, medicine's not a trade to be learned, but a profession to be entered. The treatment of a disease may be entirely impersonal, but the care of the patient must be completely personal. Or as this, um, as, as this has often been summarized by, by him, the, the, the care of the patient, the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient as a person. That's ethics. That's ethics the way it's being taught today. And, and I would uh, submit to you that uh, it's a wonderful and yet, uh, interestingly enough, a fairly elusive ideal if you've been to the doctors. And, and I have been, and I can tell you that I have both wonderful experiences of where that's happened, and, and also where it kind of seems to be the grist in the mill, and, and to be difficult to make it happen. And, uh, and part of, uh, part of what, uh, what I've been becoming involved in is, uh, is this, that uh, it's something that we'll always try to teach doctors about, how to have a better doctor-patient relationship and to do those things, but it's also been something interesting to me that since all systems of relationship are two-way, that we can also, as patients, learn how to make it more likely. In other words, we can learn how to enter these relationships with professionals and, and actually make, uh, make it more likely that we'll be heard, be understood, and that this empathetic and much uh, more productive treatment will happen. Um, just a, a quick little bit more of, of theory on this, if you will. Um, we, we talk about there being four great principles of medicine in ethics. Uh, one is justice, and we're not going to talk about that tonight. Uh, justice is the big picture. Justice is about the, the ethics and fairness of uh, the health of populations. Now, how I'm doing, but how a whole population of people is doing. It's about universal access, just access to health care, and what that means and how any society might pursue that as an ideal. It's about global health, uh, which is, you know, on one hand, if I go somewhere else in the world, uh, will I be safe? If they, those folks come here, will they bring something? Um, is it about uh, we as Americans having an obligation because uh, what we have is... Uh, so important to other places on this planet? Is it about medicine as a, uh, something that serves a common humanity? That, that could be quite a, a class in and of itself. We're not going there tonight, but, uh, but it's interesting. Um, we, we can talk about beneficence and non-maleficence, two great principles. Beneficence, uh, I should do good to my patients. Uh, non-maleficence, I should not harm them. Uh, what do these really mean? Uh, these get a little, little lost on the students, but. Uh, what they really mean is, uh, when, I am, when I am with a patient, that, that I should not be thinking about anything other than their good. That's actually tough. You can say that about any profession. As a priest, I should not be thinking about anything else but the good of my parishioners. Well, but, you know, we think about other things, too, and we have other things that go on, and sometimes we're, we're thinking about, I'm doing my job, and sometimes we're thinking about other problems I have, and, you know, it's, it, that's a hard focus to keep. It's a very uh, altruistic and idealistic thing. And, but I'd like to focus tonight on, on this whole thing about autonomy, which I, I'd like to uh, submit to you as a, has a lot to do with how the, the doctor-patient relationship is constructed. Let me give you kind of four models of, of uh, a relationship. Um, up, in, up until, when I was a kid, the, the primary, uh, I just find myself saying that more often than <laughs> uh, primary model of doctor-patient relationship was paternalism. The doctor was a kind of parent, you know, and, and basically uh, doctor knows best is the motto of that, and doctors have special knowledge. It's for my benefit. So I decide from the physician, I decide for you. Kind of seeing that kind of thing where the doctor comes in and says, here's what you need, let's do this. Don't really have to go much deeper than that. Uh, on the opposite side of that is kind of the doctor as a teacher of information 
And then you make your own decision. Interestingly enough, a lot of my students really are here. Uh, they, they believe that you know, they're, they're supposed to give a lot of information to their patients. But if you ask them, well, what, what if the patient says to you, uh, what do you think is best for me? What, do you think, what would you do if you were me? Or they, they kind of feel like, well, I, I shouldn't do that. Because then I'm imposing my ideas on somebody else. I'm leveraging the situation. So I just kind of plunk down information and then say, well, you've you got to figure out what you've got to do. Um, there are more interactive ones. Um, to some, the, the, uh, the doctor patient relationship is kind of coaching. So the, the doctor interprets these things, listens to you, and then says, okay, I, you know, let's, I, I think this is what you should do. And then there's sort of an idea of, of medicine and patients as collaborators, where you teach, where you ask, you get feedback, teach, ask, get feedback, we decide together. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of strength in this, in, in not just a scientific, but a, an emotional and a human partnership, if you will. Um, and, and this is really what I think we're, we're sort of trying to develop. Um, I think if you, if you think about um, like, like how this might play out, um, you know, a good example of these sorts of things is uh, been say in, in, uh, in recent history uh, how, how doctors and women have made decisions about treatment for breast cancer. You know, you hear a lot of people say, well, geez, you know, there was a time when, when nobody really talked about our feelings or about our body image or about, you know, what this would mean. It was just like, look, you, you, you have this disease. You've got to do X. That's the answer. Or I'll give you some information and then you do what you think is best, but we may not agree with you, but then, and now I, I think that most people are realizing that working together is pivotal. And, and, and actually the, the best of outcomes seems to have a lot to do not only with the best of science, but with the best of this kind of uh, collaboration between doctors and patients. So, um, so how do we get there? Um, well, I'd like to talk to you a little bit tonight about talking to doctors. So here's an interesting question. There's, there's been a lot of studies of this. How long do you think your doctor generally listens to you before they A, have some kind of interruption, or B, begin to formulate a plan for what's going to happen? Five minutes? 18 seconds? <laughs> yeah, you saw that at the top. Really. Yep, okay, so the answer generally is 18 seconds. Hey, that's actually not that short. It's not that, it really isn't that short. And, and you know, I'm not saying that to like impugn doctors because it's, it's but, it's a, but it's actually a window into how, um, how doctors think. Uh, a great book you might want to read if you want to know a lot about this is this book by Jerome Groupman, How Doctors Think. And it's a, little bit, it's a lot about how um, medical professionals formulate uh, their, their way of practicing. There's a lot of good reasons for this. There's not a lot of time. There's a lot of pressure. Uh, doctors have to act quickly. They don't really have all day. And there's pressure externally to see certain numbers of patients and things like that. So this in and of itself is not necessarily the enemy, but it's a factor. And, uh, and, and so what, what do you need to do if you're realizing that? Well, one of the things that I sort of, having that in mind and knowing that, when I go to the doctor now, I'm very careful to frame my main concern first. Now, when does the 18 seconds really begin to run? Um, I don't think it runs from the minute you walk through the door. I, I think it runs from the end of the small time. It's a little bit, hey, how you doing? What's happening? Uh, terrible about those meds, you know, the giants, whatever. whatever. You know, and, and then at some point, the visit clock starts running. Um, when it's like, so how can I help you today? And, and at that point, it's, it's like really important for patients to very carefully, up front, say what's most on their mind. And if, and if you don't do that, it actually makes it a little harder for the doctor in that kind of medical and social medical way of thinking to focus on what you need. It, it's also important that if you have more, more than one thing, to actually say that. 
There are two things I'd like to talk to you about today. There are two things, three things on my mind. Actually, you know, it's probably a limit to that. So it's 11 things I want to do. Oh, God, no. <laughs> Most people don't go to the doctor with 11 things on their mind. But, um, but you know, it's, it's, an, it's a fascinating thing about people uh, as to, like, why, why don't we say stuff like that? You know, why, why are we a little bit covert? Um, if you think about how human beings are, you know, let's say you have some, like, new signers sent from you. You, you wake up and you, you got a funny cough, let's say. And you, and you have it for two, two days in a row. And you think, gosh, that's, that's really weird. Um, so what's the first thing you do? Yeah, you, know, you take a little cough, man. Yeah, and, and you also do things like, well, you give it a little more time, ignore it, hope it gets better, hope it goes away, hope it stops, you know. Uh, and, and, and so it takes a little while for it, at some point, for, for you to make a decision about, well, I think I'll go to the doctor. Um, ER docs have hysterical stories about, you know, what is it that motivates someone to head down to the ER at 3 in the morning? You know, like, like what, what happened at, like, at 2.59 that changed, especially if you go down and say, you know, I came down because I have this cough. How long have you had it? Yeah, about a month. <laughs> so, so why have, and, and, but, you, but it's interesting that there's usually a reason uh, you know, the, one of the most common ones is like why people come down to 259 and 40 is that they, they maybe have been out with some friends and they're talking and somebody says, hey, you know, isn't that terrible about Joe? Like he's got lung cancer. Why do you have this weird cough? And <laughs> they call this technically a change of attribution. You know, you've been thinking, well, I've been catching a flu from the kids. All of a sudden it comes into your mind, holy smokes, maybe it's more than that. And so now... Now I'm motivated. Now, now I'm going down. I'm going off. Um, how do doctors diagnose us? Um, actually, um, this is sort of pretty interesting. That, you know, doctors do what we call differential diagnosis. They start with what you say, and then try to like make other connections, ask some other questions, rule some things out. Uh, you can hardly read the thing on the right, but that's a Stony Brook uh, flowchart for. Uh, um, for doing differential on chest pain. Okay, so, you know, walk in, I, I don't know, I have chest pain. It could be a lot of things, right? Could be the tree that you planted. Could be heart disease. Could be indigestion. Could be lots of things, right? And, and, so, uh, and, and so why do things sometimes go wrong? Well, interestingly enough, the folks who've looked at this say there's actually, in following that, that tree down, uh, there could be as much as a 10 to 20 error in, in trying to make the differential. Um, some of it is things about medicine, but, but a lot of those things can be made a little bit better by the way that, that you become a respondent, by the way that you become a reporter to your doctors. So here's some reasons things go wrong. Um, in, in this book, How Doctors Think, uh, Grupin tells a story about a, a forest ranger who's... Uh, out on patrol, and a couple of days running, he's, he's beset with some pretty serious uh, chest pain. And, and so he goes, uh, bad enough at one point, so that he goes to a, to a clinic. And, and he goes in, and, and actually the, the doc at the clinic is thrown off by the fact that he looks like the least likely person to have heart disease. He's physically fit. He's out running up and down mountains every day. Um, he's wearing his ranger uniform. Uh, he, he looks like you know this you know awesome figure, and and uh, and then, and they're thinking that's got to be it's got to be something else. It's probably overexertion. It's probably a pulled muscle. But but they're a little thrown off by the fact that he looks atypical, uh, and actually uh, tells a story about um, how they you know sort of sent him home, and and actually probably because he was so fit. Uh, you know, his, uh, his lab profiles and so forth weren't really showing anything of concern. But if there was someone who was a little bit more, uh, a little bit more obviously a candidate for, for heart disease, they might have been taken a little bit more seriously. Sometimes doctors kind of get thrown off by things like that. Uh, doctors can be thrown off by friends. And uh, I think one thing that every, uh, I know there's a good number of docs here tonight, uh, it, you're probably often asked things by friends, right? 
what do you think this could be? And, and actually, there's uh, studies have shown there's somewhat of a, uh, a reluctance to be a little bit too upfront with friends. It's actually kind of kind of hard to deal with that, especially say, oh my God, you better get to the ER. <laughs> now, sometimes people will do that when it's that obvious, but a lot of times your friend doctor may share with you the general hope that eh, it's probably nothing, <laughs> probably okay, to be influenced by, by the relationship. Um, one of the principles of differential diagnosis is most likely cause, right? So if you go to your doctor in the middle of the flu season, and you say, you know, I think I have the flu. Kind of planted an idea, and it probably is the flu. But but one of the things that sort of happens is if it's more than that, that, that anchor becomes maybe a little difficult to unlodge. Um, especially if you're thinking maybe it's something else, but it's probably the flu. But if you're going in and saying, you know, I know it's probably the flu, but to tell you the truth, I'm here because I wonder if it isn't. It feels different to me. So this way of talking and communicating can actually help, and can help, uh, you know, group says help, help the doctor not to become trapped in one way of thinking that prevents a, a more accurate uh, kind of look at what's going on with you. Uh, we can be, uh, you know, we can be sort of imprisoned by our histories. Um, I feel like this, but you know, I, I, this happens to me every year. Um, so I, I kind of plant the seed that it might be something historical. Um, or then, of course, when there are sort of symptoms that are hard to pin down, even in the differential diagnosis, a lot of, uh, a lot of people then kind of wonder, it's like, well, maybe it's kind of all in my mind. Well, it could be partially, but that could still mean something's up. And sometimes uh, the thinking that it might be in your mind can, can really sort of block the doctor's thinking. So it was an interesting study where um, they gave out to a group of ER docs a, a, a sort of a profile of the person. They said, this is a 40-year-old woman, and uh, she finds that in her apartment, uh, she can't even walk up to the second, second floor where her apartment is without stopping twice to catch her breath. So they kind of show that, just the write-up, you know, not much detail, and, and just about everybody says, boy, she probably needs some kind of workup. That's, that's very unusual. And then they show the doctor <coughs> a woman, and she's saying the, substantially the same things, but she's like very animated and like, like histrionic. So, oh, and you know, like there's these stairs, like I don't know where they got these stairs from, and I go, what the rock? And, and less people think that she's probably really sick, because they think, hey, you know, she's like worked up, something else going on. And then they show a picture of a kind of a very attractive, youngish looking, uh, well-dressed sort of woman, and she reports the symptoms in a very kind of matter-of-fact way with a little bit of concern, but just, well, you know, it's a, and interestingly enough, the number of people who think there might be something really wrong is different than just reading the description. Uh, part of it, though, one author who did that study said, well, they kind of like her and don't want her to be too sick. So they're actually blocked a little bit from being as clinical as they might otherwise be. But this, is, this should not be surprising because it is a relationship. And how people feel and what their intu intuitions are uh, really do come, in, come into play. And, and uh, you know, as, as, as much as um, you know, people do at, at times kind of get on doctors and tell you hear about somebody who missed the diagnosis or a radiologist who didn't report something. Well, you know, uh, that radiologist may have not been being, uh, being you know, careless, may have been um, being measured and saying, I don't want to over-report things. I don't want to panic people. There's things that weren't even part of the question about this, and I don't want to raise things uh, beyond concern. So there's a lot of back and forth judgment. So the relational part is, is so, so, so significant. Um, other things kind of interfere in this. And uh, I, think, I think if you talk to a lot of doctors today, they, you know, the economics of medicine really works against doctor-patient relationship 
quite a bit. I mean, I'm, as we teach people about talking more to patients, the most common objection is, and it's really substantial, is, but, I, but I'm, I'm like bound to a schedule. I, I gotta see, they're expecting me to see 20 people an hour, and, and I've gotta get through that. And I don't really have to, you know, I can't really spend time like that. So the, you know, the economics of things tends to, tends to block things too. Um, doctors are, are paid for doing tests, but, but hardly ever paid for taking some time to call a colleague or consult someone or do some more research. That, that becomes hard to work that in and to justify it into, into time. Follow up, um, learning the outcome, learning a, are you better? This, uh, this is, uh, you know, this is uh, tough to do. Given the structure of doctors' lives, um, I, I uh, sometimes just for just for fun try to compare doctor visits to, to taking your pet to the vet. You know, they, they always call you Polly up from the vet. You know, <laughs> how's Daisy doing? <laughs> I wish they couldn't call me. It could be dog gets a call. You um, bring the dog. I, I, I took this great big golden doodle to the vet last week. We sprayed her her leg or hurt her leg and. And, and I came in and the lady behind the desk said, oh my goodness, she's obviously in a lot of pain. You know what, bring her right into the room here. You'll still have to wait, but she won't have to put up with the hubbub and the aggravation, the anxiety of the waiting room. <laughs> and I said, like, you know, I could walk into a waiting room and think I have, I'm dying of cancer, and I still gotta watch, you know, the, 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 the afternoon game shows on the TV, which, you know, raises my anxiety a lot, but, uh, <laughs> What's the difference? The difference is, uh, you know, that, that, that vet's not working in this kind of world of structure, and that sometimes works uh, quite a bit against our doctors. Um, so, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about some things you can do. Um, how can you tell your story to make the diagnostic process better for physicians? How do you, how do you tell your story to make the relationship better? Well, one thing, as I mentioned, is, you know, what are your concerns? You have more than one. Uh, try, try to frame the relationship yourself. I'm here today with two things. I'm here today with something. You know, it's like a kind of a, kind of a tough thing is sometimes you you want to bring a concern up in a regular visit. You're not really worried about something. Hey, I've got an appointment next week anyway. So that physician comes to the room thinking you're just following up. Um, you know, is your blood pressure medication still okay? Blah blah blah. And you're sitting there thinking, I really want to talk about this. So, you know, when when you go in, you know, put the frame there. Say, actually, there's something that really came up that I really want to talk about. That frames it, and it helps. Um, the history. This is something that, uh, you know, sometimes they'll say, before you go for a visit, break down. When did this start? What did you do? That That's hugely helpful, and, and sometimes uh, hard to do if you haven't like really thought it out a little bit. So in other words, think about your presentation. So don't go and say, yeah, you know, that's a good question. I don't know, a week, maybe two months, or maybe less, I mean, you know. Um, get, get kind of things together and help, help your doctor understand what's happening. Um, this is a kind of interesting thing. What do you think it is? What are you afraid that it is? Now, this is kind of really important because number one, people do have intuitions. And the intuitions may be fears. Hey, could this thing be cancer? Could this be something really desperately serious? Just the fact that you might even say something like that would indicate to a doctor that, oh man, this got my patient's attention in a different way than anything else. And maybe they're fearful. Maybe they're a frightened kind of person. But maybe they're trying to tell me that, you know, this, of all the things we've talked about, this is really different. And so I, I want you to pay more attention to this. So that's kind of really important. Um, in general, it's best not to point to a, what I would call a minimizing idea. Ah, it's probably stress. Because why? Because you actually want your physician to think about what it is. You know, you say, well, it's probably stress. Well, maybe it's probably stress. And then, you know, that could, that, that, could kind of, that could kind of throw the thing off a little bit. Um, how do you leave your visit? Does the diagnosis sound right? You know, sometimes you get information from a physician and you sit there like, I don't know if I'm buying this. Does that, does this make sense? I mean, it's perfectly okay for you to say, 
you know, I, I'm not sure this is really making sense. I'm, I'm not sure it's really, could you explain to me why you think it's this? Why, why this is fitting? Um, why, why, we're do, why we're doing what we're doing? Um, you're, you're, getting, you're becoming a collaborator. You're getting involved in the process. And, and that actually can, can help, you know, your physician to be a thinker with you and, and to, you know, get to better answers. Um, there's something seen left out. Like, well, we talked about this, but, but then this other thing didn't get taken into play. And uh, how come it didn't? And why, why didn't you, why didn't you bring that? And, and you know what? It, this is kind of really kind of a little bit difficult for doctors these days because, you know, sometimes what you want to say is, you know, I kind of understand what you're saying, but, like, but then I looked at WebMD. <laughs> and, and it's kind of different than what I saw on WebMD. You know what? That's may sometimes it's going to be annoying to to professionals, but it's it's not a really a bad thing to do. You might be you know doc, Dr. Google is sometimes pretty good. <laughs> sometimes can make you crazy. Sometimes make you think you're really sicker than you are. But but sometimes raises an issue that that should be addressed. You know how 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 come I don't know I I read about this kind of problem on on. Uh, online and, and it said these kind of tests. Is there a reason you didn't send me for these tests? Uh, you're becoming educated. It's collaborative, right? That's, that's an important thing. Um, feedback. This is like a kind of a crucial thing. Like we, we train our, our docs over and over. Like this is like one of the most important things that every session ends with this question. Is there anything else? Have we covered everything? idea, do you understand? Is there anything else that you understand? And you know what? Um, if there isn't, then no, actually, I don't understand. No, there's actually something else. And you know, um, given the world of the complexity of things, uh, doctors and managers, do they say, okay, we, can, we need some more time to address that, so let's, let's get you back another time. Or let's get you back when I have a little more time. Let's do this another way. But you're a participant, okay? You're actually sort of making it happen. Um, another thing I wanted to, to, some more things in that range of uh, other questions you can ask. Actually, I have a little handout here that has some of these questions on there. What could it be? What's the most likely thing? What's the worst thing? What body parts are near my discomfort? Um, what do you think is ruled out? Could it be more than one thing? And these are, and because again, like in the diagnostic process, a lot of what goes wrong has to do with thinking and how the doc in their own mind is following down that differential. So, um, now, patient rights. Um, I, I, uh, I tried to find the uh, patient rights, um, you know, bulletin board in Stony Brook. Went up, you know what it is, by the way, in Stony Brook, at least one of them? It's in the Starbucks. <laughs> it's there, though. It's in the Starbucks. Um, Southampton's very easy to find online, and uh, actually, pretty nice website at uh, Southampton about uh, patient rights. It's a little hard to find the advocate information. How to get in touch with an advocate, but if you look for it, it's there. Um, and uh, and you know, uh, so patient rights actually are very consistent from hospital to hospital. Uh, one of the reasons is is that patient rights are generally, the outline of them is generally driven by um, the requirements for health care. So, uh, so that, you know, these are standard rights and they kind of frame things. But, but more often than not, the first one is this, be informed of the name and position of the doctor who will be in charge of your care. So now we're talking here not about office visits, but institutional care, care in hospitals. This is actually a huge question. Um, you know how many people end up in hospitals and they don't really know who's in charge of their care? Who's, and, and actually, the answer is a lot of times, well, not really any one person. Particularly if you kind of came in one way and then got moved to a different service because you came in with one kind of pain, but you, know, you came in because you broke your hip, but now actually your cardiac stuff is more important. Uh, and it got, got you moved over to that service, and those people are paying a lot of, so what, you can kind of end up down the road where, who's in charge? But, you know what? Um, 
this is a place where, where you or a family member can be a, a real advocate and say, well, we want to know who, we want to talk to them. And I want to say, like, I, I feel like I need to have somebody who's at least explaining to me why what's going on here makes sense. Is everybody really working together? Um, are, are, are some people not understanding the big picture? Uh, again, the, you know, communication can sort of go off. And this is, a, you know, this is, a, this is your right and, and bringing that to attention. Where do you bring patient right kinds of things? Um, first, to your, first to your doctor, try, you can find, try to find out who that person is. Um, but again, most institutions have either a patient advocate or a patient representative, sometimes called, or a um, ethics committee. In, in Stony Brook, um, I'm on the Institutional Ethics Committee, and only about 20% um, of our consults have to do with really puzzling issues of consent or medical decision making or what to do. Or uh, About 80% of it are, are fundamental off the track things between patients and families and doctors. And what, de what actually tends to happen is the, the consult rep goes in and just says, let's have a meeting and let's talk about what's going on. Get everybody together and, and try to make a plan. So that becomes a, the important thing. Um, so there you go. Okay. So anyway, uh, I'm going to stop there and let me see if you have any questions. Um, or maybe you have some things that you'd like to raise. I also have some handouts for you. I, I can pass those out while you're taking okay. questions. Yeah. You can tell it was a third page. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, uh, questions, comments, ideas? That's scary. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, well, you know, um, there's a couple of things. I mean, sometimes uh, you might have to take a look at this. Is it is it the is it the conversation with the doctor themselves, or sometimes it's the bigger picture? Well, I've i told some people I know uh, I, I really love you as a physician, but your office is better. Than you know, just the way that I'm treated when I call for an appointment, or, and you know, actually, a lot of times it's a blend. I'm glad to know that. I had no idea that my, my front end was, you know, because I, you know, what, what's the, what's the sort of the, you know, pivotal thing is I, I'm going to treat when you call on the phone. You know, when you say like, I, I got to have an appointment. I'm really, I'm really sick. And I say, well, uh, what are you doing next August 4th? <laughs> um, but you're saying actually that, you know. Um, without knowing specifics, I would say that like, if you're in any relationship, uh, we could start to change the way You know, there's some things here about, some concerns that I don't feel like uh, actually had this happen with Dr. Who I thought was a really good doc, and I, I would go there again, but the one thing I said to him, I said, John, I, I'm not getting the logic of my character. I, I'm, it's not, I'm not doing it, I really understand what you're doing and why, and, and it's just, if you take a couple of minutes to explain to you what's really going on. Now, you know, sometimes, um, sometimes maybe you, like in any relationship, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, if I, I, mean, I do a lot, I do counseling, if somebody came to me and said, they didn't really pay attention to me, they didn't really understand me, I would be surprised to find out. I went somewhere else. Sometimes we make, you know, an interesting thing about medicine is sometimes we make, we make a sort of decision between what we perceive to be the fundamental competence of the doctor and the relationship. And I mean, there, there actually are, actually are people who are very technically good at things, but like maybe not so good at that. 
And so sometimes you say, well, I, you know, I can kind of put up with that. Because, but I think probably for all of us, there's a need to have someone in that position now who kind of gets, you know, us. And then understand that. And it's interesting, when you look through the patient rights, um, and I do look a little bit deeper into the New York State, uh, so of course in regard to patient care, there's good bit there about uh, premature or inappropriate discharge. And patients have a right to question discharge if they don't feel that they're, you know, that they're okay to go home. Or if the, or if they kind of are not being discharged into the, into the right environment. And it could be that they're assuming, oh, that's great, you're here, you're going to take care of it. Um, would you mind just going oh, back to the background only because I, I know yep. some people can hear you better. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I think that that, that that can be an important thing. Uh, I mean, I, I've had that even with um, fellow priests where you say, oh, you're going to go here and take Father X home. And it's like, wait a minute, we're, we're not, that's not the kind of, like, that's not, our relationship or our world that doesn't work that way, and, and you gotta treat this a little differently. Um, yeah. Recently, I had an experience with a hospital, and I find that the whole world has changed. It used to be that your family doctor would recommend you into the hospital, and that's who you spoke with, right. even though experts might be it. But now you go in the hospital. And there is a hospitalist right. who has been assigned to you, you've never met before, he passes you on. So it's a whole new <clears throat> relationship. It's a new relationship. Right. It, it's not, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, hospitalists are sort of a, a characteristic of the busy world. And, you know, your primary, primary doctors are actually pretty hard to come by these days. <laughs> And, and, and so, you know, the idea of that doctor who sent you to the hospital will come and visit you and follow up with you, well, what that doctor has done is refer you to a hospitalist, okay? Hopefully, um, with some communication, uh, in the hospital you're going to meet, and they're going to follow you while they're there. And then you might want to know, well, uh, and how are they going to communicate with you? Or how am I going to communicate with you? And, and how do I come back to you? How does it loop around? How does this relationship not sort of sail off here so that I, I uh, get discharged and I'm not really sure now who to go back to or, or what to do with things uh, if I have some problems. But yeah, that's, that's um, actually in general, I, I think uh, the existence of primary care in the future is a huge question in the United States. At, at Stony Brook, um, the graduating class now, uh, if you, if you, you might consider pediatrics and OBGYN to be primary care, uh, because a lot of people use, obviously, children and many women will use uh, OB as, a, as a, OBGYN as a primary care doctor. But aside from them, uh, less than 3% of the graduates go into anything that looks like primary care. Primary care itself, internal medicine, um, family medicine. So it's, uh, you know, it's definitely a, a focus now on the, the more discrete specialties. I know this is an open question, but uh, uh, what do you think of uh, living wills and health care proxies, but living wills in particular? Um, I, I'm not a fan of living wills. 
healthcare proxy. The problem with living wills is that, and, and uh, it's interesting that back in the days of Karen Quillen and all, uh, a lot of attorneys wanted to draw up for their, you know, people who are making will, making regular wills, and saying, oh, you should have a, a living will. And then drafting these uh, complicated documents about mechanical ventilation and in the event of this and the event of that. The problem is, is that it is so difficult to anticipate exactly what might happen to someone. Now, I think if people are aware of something very specific, it can be helpful. For example, if a person is a dialysis patient and says, if I, if I now end up being mentally incapacitated, I would not want the dialysis continued. A lot of anticipation that it's a reasonable projection of the future. Uh, the problem of having these sort of general things of, you know, if I am unrecoverable and I'm in a persistent state, it would not want to. It's so hard to anticipate all the different ways that that might come about. So the the beauty of the healthcare agent, the healthcare proxy, where you appoint someone else, is that you say that the fact that this person knows me pretty well, I, I, I'll regard their decision for me as being just as good as my own. And now it's flexible, because they can deal with something that hasn't yet come up. You know, I, I, I kind of like to use this example. If I, if I, if I say to, you know, uh, we've hung out a little bit, and I, if I say to you, Bob, pick me up some lunch, whatever they have. Well, you go down and say, I mean, I've seen Father Mike have uh, pastrami sandwiches. I, I'll get him one of those. That'd be fine, you know? But if they say, Bob, give me a pastrami sandwich only on real seeded rye, and only if they have the brown mustard. And they go down and they don't have one of those things. Now, what do you do? I could end up with nothing. Because <laughs> you come home and say, I, I don't know. They, they, didn't have, they, didn't, they didn't have what you said, so now I didn't know what to get. So it's too specific. So it's too specific. And it's hard to, especially in very young people, hard to be um, that, that specific about what the future will be. So I think the, the, uh, the proxy is the, the way to go, I think. And of course, when you're doing, making a proxy in New York, you have to remember there's a, there's a line in there where you can write stuff. And, and you have to write, if you want to write it this way, I have discussed with my agent my wishes with regard to nutrition and hydration, and uh, my agent has the ability to make those decisions in my behalf. New York State has specially excluded decisions about nutrition and hydration unless um, you mention in creating the proxy that, that you will allow your, your healthcare agent to do that. It used to be a checkbox. Yeah. Okay, now on the official forms that you get from the state if you use them, you actually have to write it in. Is that what's the advanced directive? Yeah. 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 Yeah, an advanced directive is, uh, is, uh, is, any, um, is any statement about what you want for the future. Now, advanced directives don't have to be written. Okay, so, so if, you, if you say to your doctor, if you're, let's say, God forbid, you're, a, you're an end state, stage patient, you're, you've got some incurable uh, disease, and, and you say, you know, when I, when I, when I lapse into unconsciousness, I, I do not want to receive anything special in regard to nutrition, hydration, or resuscitation. I, um, at that point, uh, I don't want any aggressive care. I don't want you to treat me. If I get infected, just let me go. That's an advanced directive. We don't have to go to your healthcare proxy then and say, what do we do now? Because you told us what to do. And hopefully your physician wrote down on November 16th, Judy told me that this were, these were her wishes. So that that's so sometimes the fact that that can be hard to find or so forth is all the more reason that you should have a healthcare agent who you have told. And the most important thing about healthcare agents is you tell them that they're your healthcare agent. You don't want them to be surprised. Hey, did you know that you were Judy's healthcare agent? <laughs> Me? No kidding, really? Do you want to surprise them? And and when you fill out the form. You want to give the form to your agent because you want them, if you're ever in need, 
for you to walk in to the institution and say, come on. Yeah. I, and I, I think that's one of the things about Southampton that's uh, terrific is that house staff. And, um, and, but, you know, they do something else there which I, which I think is really um, pivotal because it's very, because it's communication. And that is that they tell you that they're a team. They do. They, they don't surprise you. I will be here next week, but I'll stop it and say hello. Yeah. So you said, like, yeah, um, I'm, I'm not going to be here tomorrow, but... Dr. X's and, and, and I'm gonna you know we're all gonna be following up. That I mean communication's everything. It's a good idea to be first. Yeah. yeah, and it's and it's very hard for patients if they're surprised by it. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think that's one of the real uh, wonderful things about Southampton is that the communication network is is excellent. I'm getting up because I don't see any hands right now, and I okay. want to I wanna thank you for just it was a wonderful presentation. I think, I think we would all agree. <laughs> Things on here. Um, so there's a couple little, like I wrote down some of the questions there that are good questions for interacting. There's two websites there for uh, patient rights. Uh, one from Southampton, which as I said, very nicely done, excellent website. Uh, the New York State Patient Rights page, which is a ton more stuff than anybody would ever want to know. But if you want looking for something a little obscure, it's all there. And, uh, and you know, remember that institutions have advocates or representatives. And if uh, it's not evident, uh, ask them who it is. They're very helpful to people. And uh, I'll recommend three books. Dear Jerome Groupman's, well, one book, this one, How Doctors Think, a lot of great stories. And here, Groupman's a wonderful position. He's required reading for all of our gang at Stony Brook. And, and two people who do a lot of articles and have done some books too, uh, a New York City physician, Danielle Offrey, frequently in the New York Times, and, uh, and you know, like our hero, Atul Gawande, you know, and, uh, and he's on uh, a lot of videos on PBS, you can find him on, on YouTube, and both of them have great websites. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. flyers. We'll make a few more copies. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you again. And we decided it would be ethically okay to give you a library bag. <laughs> <laughs> and a, gift, a small gift certificate to take. Thank you. <laughs>